Okay, I'm going to introduce our next presenter. Her name is Jen Lang, and Jen is currently the Conservation Science Coordinator at Seattle Audubon, where she helps manage four community and citizen science programs. She's originally from Brooklyn, New York, and spent a few years as an avian field technician monitoring birds for various organizations prior to joining Seattle Audubon. She has a master's degree in quantitative science from the, I think it has something to do with numbers, <laughs> uh, from the UW uh, analyzing data from the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team, the COAST many of you have probably heard of, and a BS in wildlife science from the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Watching and learning about birds have always been a passion of hers, and she pursues them avidly in the field and her studies. Although, I don't know if she's actually ever caught any birds. Maybe you can. I have. I have caught birds, actually. Oh, thank you. I think we're good. <laughs> yeah, I've done lots of mist netting and uh, box trapping and news, news traps for shorebirds. But um, yeah, so if you want to talk about trapping birds, you could talk about, talk about that to me too. But uh, thank you all for coming and welcome. So I'm here to talk about the Puget Sound Seabird Survey, which we should now rename as the Southern Salish Sea Seabird Survey. So SSSSS, potentially. Um, because we've recently just expanded, but this program is actually 12 years old. And I'm going to give a broad uh, description of the birds in our area. but. You probably already know about the Salish Sea. It was coined in uh, the 1980s by Bert Weber from here in, in Bellingham. So this is a really broad slide that I'm sure you're really familiar with. But essentially, we're I'm just trying to portray that we, ha we share a really dynamic and large area of water that incorporates a lot of animals and birds. Um, mammals and just a variety of wildlife and this shared marine ecosystem is extremely diverse and we have the ability to see how that diversity changes across the waters and over time especially with, ch with climate change so um, we're considering the entire shared ecosystem here, and for the past 11 seasons, the Puget Sound Seabird Survey has actually been documenting birds in the nearshore and marine habitat all throughout the Southern Salish Sea. Oh, I have a pointer, don't I? Uh, the Southern Salish Sea, oh gosh, Southern Salish Sea and the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And this season, we've actually expanded to sites up here in San Juan Islands and Whatcom County. Um, but first, who are these birds that we're actually monitoring? So for those who here are familiar with seabirds in our area? I know. Awesome, wonderful. Well, what I'm designing, defining as a marine bird is a bird that is highly dependent on marine and habitat and marine-derived food in the near shore waters. So these are examples of the birds that you likely be able to see if you're out there in Puget Sound or in Salish Sea looking for food, relying on the water for resting, for feeding, preening, and using the near shore land for breeding. Though some of these birds are, do breed and migrate very far away to complete their, their biological processes. So what I'm going to talk about is um, breaking these birds down that you just saw in the previous slides into groups or guilds. So they could be broken down taxonomically, which means breaking them down through genetic and um, similarity, and also by natural history or how they breed, what they eat, where they like to hang out. So first of all, marine birds could be broken down based on where they're from, where they like to live for the majority of the year. So we have residents and also migrants. We've got birds that stay within Washington or in the Salish Sea waters all year round. And then we also have birds that come down from the Arctic after breeding in the summer 
and overwinter here in sheltered waters in Puget Sound and Salish Sea and Strait of Juan de Fuca. So what I'm going to be indicating here is that is residents as purple boxed birds and migrants as red boxed birds. So if you think about Western Washington, UW, purple huskies, and WSU, Eastern Washington, red migrants. So keep that in mind as I go through the next slides. So migrants are birds that breed elsewhere, outside of Salish Sea. So that includes ducks, geese, grebes, and loons, and other birds as well as, as that. So we've got shearwaters in there as well. But if you look at migrants, they usually are breeding in the inland waters in Canada, further north to Alaska, and then moving down south to the US, the continental US, for, to overwinter. And this is where they come down in, during the winter time because, of course, it's not iced over. And it has a lot of food availability as well as the ability for um, them to feel safe and warm. And um, as juveniles, they would be able to grow and get larger when they go to places with more food sources than the Arctic, of course. So migrants typically begin arriving in September um, into our area in Puget Sound and also depart in March and April. So you have an uh, influx of a lot more marine birds um, during that September, October time. And most likely they, they mostly peak in our area around November and December. And then they start leaving around March to be able to go back up north to breed. So marine birds can also, the gills can also be broken down by what they like to eat. So what, what, do, what food do these birds rely on when they're down here in Puget Sound and Salish Sea? So we're looking at benthivores, benthi, meaning bottom dwelling animals and organisms. You've got a lot of diving ducks, especially golden eyes, um, surf scoters, um, that like to eat these benthivores or mollusks, crustaceans, etc. You have omnivores, birds that eat almost everything, mostly gulls. Piscivores, uh, like this pigeon guillemot here, like to eat forage fish and other fish as well. And then you have herbivores, which mostly are just these geese, the brant, or Canada geese. Um, and for the next few slides, I am going to be referencing these little pictures depicting what these birds like to eat. And of course, remember the colors here. What does the red mean? Migrating. And we've got purple for resident birds. Yep, UW, huskies. So um, for marine bird guilds, the groups that we typically see in our area running down what we commonly find in Puget Sound and Salish Sea. We've got our loons here, diving birds that like to go after fish. Um, we've got grebes, um, also diving birds that also like to go after fish, though different kinds. Uh, and cormorants, so cormorants, double, the double-crested and the pelagic are residents. Whereas most of these other birds that you see here and the names, this is the common name for the, each of these birds listed, are migratory, so they come in mostly during the winter and stick around and disperse out to more pelagic or different areas during the summer times. Now we have, then we have um, the next few groups, ducks and geese, brant, surf scoter, bufflehead, and golden eye. These are one of our most common species that we have in Puget Sound, surf scoter being one of the most abundant species that we've seen in the Puget Sound Seabird Survey. Um, Buffleheads are mostly in more brackish or freshwater uh, areas and found in groups as well. So this is kind of, the buffleheads are usually found in different habitats than brant, surf scoter, and golden eye. Um, but they're just examples of many ducks and geese that we do see in our areas here in the waters. We also have alcids. So alcids comprise of guillemot, auklets, and other puffins, like the tufted puffins, and also marbled murrelet. Um, has anybody seen a marbled murrelet before? Awesome. Yes, and we're going to talk about the marbled murrelet pretty soon, but they're a really big species of concern. For gulls and terns, 
uh, gulls, of course, are very difficult to identify when in the fields because a lot of the times they are hybridized or they are juvenile birds and their plumage are not as starkly identifiable as many of these other birds that we have um, in our area. But the most common birds that we usually see in our areas are Glaucus wing gulls, Mew gulls, Bonapartes, and sometimes Caspian terns. We do have breeding Caspian terns in West Seattle and in some of the inlying uh, areas. So this might actually be purple for some populations. So why do we actually lo look for birds and try to learn about birds? Well, m marine birds in particular are wonderful indicators of the marine habitat. So first of all, they rely on a wide prey base. They actually tell us a lot about forage fish because if you might imagine, Finding forage fish and actually documenting forage fish is really difficult because we can't see them under the water. Marine birds, on the other hand, if you see large flocks of surf scoters or other birds, you're likely to find the prey that they're looking for in the areas they're hanging out and also where they're most abundant. So what we've found is that the presence of surf scoters is actually really indicative of herring spawn and other herring areas. So that's actually one thing that... Um, WDFW does when looking for doing those herring rakes of the eggs to actually look for flocks of surf scoters and then pinpoint to that area for the eggs of herring. So not only that, they have their reproductive success or their ability to fledge young, to have babies that succeed to become adults, um, is directly tied to environmental conditions. So if there isn't enough food in the marine environment for them to succeed in creating an egg, and then having that egg hatch and, and fledge to become an adult, then that's likely because there wasn't enough food or resources for the adult to keep this, the chick alive and stay healthy. So if the success of that colony declines and they don't have as many chicks come out of the colony as usual, then we're likely to know that there's something in the marine environment that did not allow them to succeed that year compared to other years. So overall, they would provide a good insight to the health of the Salish Sea um, because of multiple factors. Um, and in fact, that's what the Puget Sound Seabird Survey is trying to get at. We're trying to figure out how many birds are actually using our near shore marine habitat during the winter and um, how that changes over the years. So it's kind of, it's a, a way to be able to um, document whether our marine habitat is sufficient to support all of the wintering seabirds that come into our area and whether those populations are moving over time. So we've established this program um, in 2007. Uh, and have been, do have been doing seabird surveys in the winter time from October to April for 11 years now. This is our 12th year. So we first started with 30 volunteers and 28 sites and now it's grown to over 240 volunteers and 155 sites this year. So all of the warm colors that you see here, the reds and the oranges are the more recently initiated sites. The blues are actually the uh, original sites that we had. And now we've actually expanded to include 37 new sites in San Juan Islands, in Skagit, and Whatcom counties. Um, so we are trying to get a good picture of what marine birds are using our habitat and also approximately how many are there. And the beauty of our program is that we have the ability to create a snapshot or have people go out on the exact same day, approximately in the same time, to get a picture of what that abundance and presence of birds are every month for 11 years. So, um, so far, we have recorded 70, 72 distinct species, not including rarities like the one-off brown booby that we saw last year, or the one-off um, like Jaegers or like those fun rarities. But as I was saying, we do get a snapshot. So we have people do surveys from 15 to 30 minutes within a four hour window that we designate. So everybody is um, approximately out there at, at the same time and collecting data on birds uh, in their 
at the near shore habitat. So all surveys are conducted within two hours of high tide. And we try to have everyone identify and record all the seabirds that they see, prioritizing birds that are closer to you um, so that we could get a confident identification as well as count of all the birds that are using the nearshore habitat. And of course, we record um, survey conditions to learn about whether there are factors influencing your ability to see birds or whether there is something influencing the behavior of birds, reducing the number of birds in your area. So um, our program uses uh, distance sampling, so that's what these two images are. We ask people to collect information on what direction that bird is from you, as well as approximately how far the bird is from you by measuring the distance that bird is from the horizon. So we do fancy triangulation math to figure out approximately where that bird is from you um, based on where you're standing, how tall you are, and also where that ho opposite horizon is. It's very interesting. And it's actually pretty complex, um, but we try to simplify it for everybody who is a volunteer for us so that we could uh, make it more accessible for everyone and also to allow um, all of the work to be on our end and not on yours. So that is our goal, to do distance sampling to better estimate how many birds are truly out there. Because the further a bird is from you, the less likely you are to actually identify 100% all of the birds. So by collecting information on how far that bird approximately is, we have the ability to estimate how many birds might we be missing. So if you want to talk about distance sampling a little bit more, feel free to ask me questions later. But General idea here is that we're trying to get a picture of how many birds are within that near shore environment um, across Puget Sound in the Southern Sailor Sea. So the birds that we commonly record are um, these here. We have, I think, 12 species here. But what I've highlighted are the birds that um, are actually considered uh, marine birds of interest. So these birds, all of these birds, are commonly found in Puget Sound um, during our surveys and also throughout Puget, throughout Puget Sound. Um, but we have six birds that we consider marine bird species of interest based on the Puget Sound Ecosystem Monitoring Program. Has anybody ever heard of uh, the Puget Sound Partnership before? Great. So the Puget Sound Partnership is a state program, is a state um, organization that uh, <laughs> that actually has created something called the Puget Sound Vital Signs. So these signs are, um, I know it's very difficult to see them all and it's very colorful, but essentially what we're looking at is this section here. We're looking at um, vi vital, in indi uh, vital indicators of Puget Sound, um, specifically Pacific herring, orcas, Chinook salmon, and six marine birds to help us learn more about thriving species and the food web in Puget Sound. So the Puget Sound Ecosystem Monitoring Program is a program that was initiated and is managed by Puget Sound Partnership based out of Tacoma, but it is a state-run government, is a state-run organization that um, is having a, like having an idea of the pulse of Puget Sound based on all of these different um, vital signs or indicating um, measurements. So if you'd like to learn more about this, definitely feel free to visit the Puget Sound Ecosystem Monitoring Program. But what I wanted to highlight, um, let's see, uh, are again these six marine bird species. So what we have here are three, are three resident species and three migrant species. Um, and these were chosen from majority, well, the dominant counted, the most abundant birds that we have in Puget Sound. Um, and what we've found is that these birds are, uh, they have been able to do a, a lot of different monitoring programs and also collect data from other citizen science programs to figure out what the um, current status of all of these six birds are and what does that mean for Puget Sound. So what we found is, um, that the pigeon guillemot and rhinoceros auklet are both stable. The marble murrelet is declining, and I'm going to go into um, all of these in the next few slides. The western grebe is declining in our area, 
and surf scoters and white wing scoters are stable or increasing. So by doing a combination of collecting data from citizen science programs like Puget Sound Seabird Survey, as well as doing um, boat transects and aerial transects with WDFW, they found that these, this is the current status of all of these six species in their 2017 vital sign marine bird population abundance report. And this is available online. It's definitely an interesting read if you'd want to check it out. Um, and again, this is on the Puget Sound Partnership website. Um, but these current trends are really important for us because they give us an idea of what is happening with the forage fish in Puget Sound and also the general environment. So why were these bird species, these bird species actually chosen? Well, first of all, pigeon guillemots are, and rhinoceros auklets are both found all throughout Puget Sound and Southern Salish Sea. So these are actually images from uh, our PSSS surveys. So the surveys that we conduct, we've found um, the, col the hotter colors here indicate uh, how frequently they are observed in our surveys. So the warmer color, the more likely they are to be found in, in our surveys. Um, and keeping in mind that these new balloons here are actually from just October. So this is saying that we've seen pigeon guillemot in these sites in October. And, and, um, and for rhinoceros auklets, we've seen these, uh, we've seen areas with rhinoceros auklets in three sites in our new sites. But what I'm trying to portray here is that with these balloons, you could see that pigeon guillemot and rhinoceros auklet are found throughout Puget Sound in, um, in some areas much more frequently than others. Um, but in general, they're highly, uh, they occupy a lot of our, our waters. Not only that, they breed here as um, being a resident means. The pigeon guillemot, um, the would be, sorry, the would be Audubon uh, pigeon guillemot surveys are, is actually a citizen science program that has people going out uh, doing burrow monitoring and surveying for pigeon guillemot throughout Whidbey Island. So this is actually documenting all of the pigeon guillemot colonies on Whidbey Island alone. This is not including the fact that, would, that uh, pigeon guillemot also breed throughout Puget Sound and other islands. So it's kind of, you could confidently say that Pigeon guillemot are well distributed in their colonies throughout Puget Sound. For rhinoceros auklets, um, I guess I should have circled these, but their colonies are isolated to Protection Islands here, Tatouche Island, and Destruction Island. Um, though they have been documented to do one-off burrows in several other out outlying islands, these three are actually the ones that are monitored every year by... Um, WDFW partnering with um, Oikonos, which is another nonprofit organization. Uh, so these two resident species are really well documented and have colonies throughout, um, throughout our area, which is really exciting to see. So for the marbled murrelet, um, this bird is a very interesting case. The marbled murrelet is a bird that um, is mostly affected by both the marine and terrestrial ecosystem. So they're very unique in the fact that they rely on a marine environment to survive and also to support their young, but they nest only in old growth forest. So they actually nest on the branches of, of old Douglas fir trees in, our, in the Olympic National Forest and also um, in the Cascades. So these dots here are actually locations of where they've been documented to have nested and had young. And this is where they're actually found year-round breeding and non-breeding. So marble murrelets typically spend the majority of their life out at sea, but they fly over 50 miles to get to some of their nest sites to feed their single chick. So as a, as a seabird, most seabirds are um, they only usually have one chick each season, specifically for the marble murrelet, they only have one chick. So they devote a lot of resources to a single chick, and a lot of the times they don't survive because of corvids or other um, 
or disturbances, so particularly logging, has been influencing this bird's ability to just breed. Um, and yeah, so marble merlet are declining quite rapidly. Um, over, they were actually federally less listed as threatened in um, 1992 and in Washington state in 1993, so this is actually mislabeled. They were federally threatened by uh, the states, like the, um, all of, like the entire nation in 1992, and then in Washington state alone, listed as federally, as a state threatened in 93. And you could see that the, um, these birds have been declining approximately 5% every year since uh, the surveys began in 2000. Um, that were d dedicated to documenting how many marble merlets there are in Puget Sound in general. So um, the view for marble merlets is pretty grim, and a lot of the issue is the fact that logging is a really big uh, competitor for conserving land for this bird specifically. So currently, there's actually a public comment period uh, until November 6th to learn about um, what actions or management plans are in place for the future of this bird. Um, so you're welcome to view that and also comment on it if you think that those protections need to be more, um, I guess, more emphatic. But yes, so that's the marble merlet. Uh, we also have the western grebe. So the western grebe is a, is a migrant bird, and it's also declining in our area. So as you can see, western grebes are typically only here in the winter or non-breeding season, and they go into the inland um, waters for during migration. But what we found is that these birds are also, they are seasonally, they contract in their numbers. So um, these birds actually when they come into our area at first, these red dots are indicating where western grebes are found in our surveys. And what you could see is that in October, they're pretty widespread throughout southern Puget Sound. So this is uh, the central basin. Um, and then they actually cons constrict in their uh, abundance and their presence. So they actually have a contraction of where they like to hang out during the winters, and then they um, distribute afterwards, so they just leave afterwards. So what we found is that when they first come in, they're pretty widespread, and then they just kind of shrink in where they like to hang out in, until they're in just a single spot in April. And after that, they just disperse. What we found with Western Greaves as well is that their population is actually potentially moving further south. So their general population of all of the birds in this species is actually starting to move, move further south um, potentially due to climate change and the change in the temperature that Puget Sound has been experiencing recently. So it might be that their decline in our area is not necessarily because their population numbers are going down, but more that their population center is shifting from Washington down to California. So that's something to consider as well. Sorry? Oh, okay. Yes, it is kind of unusual, um, and we're not quite sure why. They are piscivores. They are looking for a specific species of fish, um, and uh, they might just be finding more abundance of their forage fish down south. We don't know, though. So the surf scoter and white wing scoter, which, have both, which are both stable, um, are obviously extremely ubiquitous, especially for the surf scoter. A little bit less so for the white winged, but um, both of these inform each other. So white-winged and surf scoters sometimes co-mingle. They like to flock together. But um, surf scoter are actually one of our most abundant birds that we see in Puget Sound Seabird Survey. And they're, uh, they're a bird that's um, extremely important for us to know about because they return to the same molting spot every year after year. They also depend on herring spawn and the eelgrass beds that we've been hearing about earlier today. And um, they're most abundant in fall and winter and early spring. So they consistently have extremely high counts, which is good. So that tells us that there is a consistency in their numbers in both their breeding grounds as well as um, in Puget Sound. And uh, we've actually f counted in the last year's season alone 
13,961 surf scoters in total. So we see a lot of them, and it's really good that we have been seeing a lot of them consistently over the years, most recently, too. So outside of um, looking at these specifically six species that we've indicated as marine indicator species, um, for our program, we do uh, monthly data summaries and analyses to provide to our volunteers to give them an idea of what this year looks like compared to other years. So one thing that we like to do is um, tally species richness. How many species have you recorded this month versus um, this month last year or years pr prior to that? And comparing, well, I can't really see it very much, comparing the um, number of species to the average over the years that we've been doing data collection, and also looking at abundance of the most abundant species they see. So surf scoters, um, surf scoters are almost always at the top for each month, um, though in October before they arrive, we usually get buffleheads or American widgeon as one of these uh, top spots in October, because surf scoters don't come in until around November and December. So. This is just kind of a, a way for us to be able to give back to our volunteers like, hey, this is where your site ranked in number of species that you've seen and how many birds you've seen over this month compared to other months. Um, not only that, we've uh, also done some research and scientific, um, well, we've written some scientific papers. Um, most recently, we've had a publication out in 2015 about looking and identifying local hotspots of seabirds in Puget Sound based on occurrence. So how prevalent, or based on where these birds are found, where do they appear to be grouping the most? So we were looking at hotspots, particularly looking at um, the warmer colors here. Uh, where do these hotspots occur where lots of birds tend to flock? And also, when does that occur? So we can know. How, that, how is that community shifting and is it shifting over time? We also have been doing, a, we've done a most recently a study, again, looking at hot spots, but in a different light. So we're looking at um, what species actually have the ability to have hot spots. So which species are mo more likely to be found in, in certain areas compared to others, relative to other sites. and. Um, are those hot spots different in what time they occur? How long are they hot for? How long do they tend to group as many species as possible? As al and also provide us with feedback to where can we find the most birds in general? For people who are interested as birders in general, where are these birds flocking to and where can I see the most of them? So, the results of these of the studies come comes as these kind of plots or these maps here. So you can see for each species we have um, these dots indicating sites. The warmer colored the dot, the more birds there are, um, or that's where that bird typically likes to, uh, like, that's typically where that bird likes to hang out essentially with more with more of the same con con specifics. So. These colors are relative to all of the other sites in the area. Um, so you could see that rhinoceros auklets tend to clump up in certain areas and not be found in, men in the southern basin, whereas western grebes like to hang out in the central basin by Seattle, curiously enough, and not be found in so the south basin here. The surf scoters are found in three different spots. And essentially, when we compile these maps all together, we come up with something that looks like this. Where do birds like to hang out together? And who, who likes to hang out with who? So we have, um, this, this, uh, these are hot spots that are shared by these birds in these boxes. So if you were to go to specific areas, you're more likely to see these birds than in any of the other sites that we have in Puget Sound Seabird Survey. So that's what our um, most recent analysis, which is actually working toward publication right now, is um, expressing, which is really, really exciting for us. So overall, in conclusion, 
PSSS now documents sea seabirds occupying more than just Puget Sound. Since we're further up north here, we're getting a better idea of what the entire Salish Sea looks like. And mo most recently, we've been talking to um, Bird Studies Canada to work with their Coastal Water Bird Survey to try to combine our data and get an idea of, an, of how marine birds look and how they're distributed in abundance throughout, Puget, throughout Salish Sea. So further north in British Columbia and also in the Strait of Georgia. And overall, we're trying to get a picture of overwintering seabirds using our nearshore near shore waters in the Salish Sea. And that's important to us for a variety of reasons, to understand the health of our marine ecosystem um, through counting birds, which is much easier than counting individual fish. So thank you so much for listening. And uh, d definitely ask if you have any questions. Hi. Um, I am wondering, there's a kind of big blank spot on some of your maps around the canal and the northern Kitsap Peninsula. Mm -hmm. Is that because you're not surveying there? Yes, we're currently not surveying there. One of the biggest limitations for our sites, for our survey, is that we want to have public access, and a lot of those areas are all private. Um, and also, to be able to find volunteers to survey those areas, um, and yeah, so our biggest limitations are, is the public access to we have people who are willing to go out to those sites every month and, and do our surveys. Um, so yes, we're trying to work on filling in those gaps, um, but those definitely are limitations for us. Yeah, the gaps right here for Hood Canal and Upper Kitsap in that area. Go ahead. So you, ha you had a number of what, 13,000 or so surf scoters. Um, how do you know you're not double counting, or how do you, how do you, how do you arrive at that number? So that number is not total abundance for sure, uh, and it's also um, approximate flock estimations too. So that is a very conservative estimate of how many we actually have seen over over throughout the Puget Sound survey for that season, um, and. What we try to do is uh, ensure that people are recording. Well, it's difficult to see to know if we're recording doubly across sites because, of course, those flocks might fly to the next site um, and hang out there. But uh, yeah, so we're trying to document only the birds that are within that 15 and 30 minutes, and within that that time period, also make sure that people are keeping track of the flock as best as they can. Um, so not adding more individuals based on, um, yeah, so recording what, what they could see. And we only ask people to do the best that they can. So we know that that's not an exact number. Are you coordinating the time? Y yes. Among the various sites, like everybody go at 8 o'clock on all the different sites? Yes, yeah, so we are. We try to coordinate the time for um, all of the people doing their surveys at once. So we actually give everybody a four-hour window, and say, try to do your survey within this four-hour window to the best of your ability. So yeah, it's a four-hour window. It's not. It's not saying you must go at eight o'clock. Yes. So there is a potential for um, birds to fly from one site to the next and then be counted again, and uh, from that. It's hard to say that, um, yeah. But but what we're trying to do ultimately is uh, we're not trying to use those counts as true abundance. So we're trying to use those counts to inform what we estimate to be abundance uh, using our distance sampling product, our distance sampling statistics. So yes, um, it is a rough estimate, and that count is the approximate number that people have actually written down in their data sheets of what they think is the best estimate of how many birds were there. Yeah. Uh, are there birds, uh, certain species increasing? Yeah, I think so. Uh, species in, in number, you mean like abundance of species? Yes, so surf scoters have definitely been um, doing well, we believe, from our records. They've been increasing in number, um, and uh, based on the 
Puget Sound Partnership, they've actually also documented an increase in surf scoters uh, through their aerial surveys. So that's really exciting and good to hear. Um, and I can't pull out any other species at the moment, but I do believe that there are a few that, that are doing pretty well, I hope. And who conducts the BC Bird Survey? So Bird Studies Canada uh, manages the BC Coastal Water Bird Survey, and their protocol is actually pretty similar to our Puget Sound Seabird Survey. Um, so Bird Studies Canada is a government-run organization, but it's also a nonprofit, which is kind of strange. But they um, manage multiple citizen science programs in BC, and Coastal Water Bird Survey has been running for about 12 years um, as well, which is really cool. So we actually have some comparable protocols as well as a time series that we could be able to work with them. It's really exciting. My last question is, how do you qualify people to uh, identify birds? So we've recently uh, in inducted a new seabird identification quiz <laughs> in our um, query for whether you're interested in being part of our program. So we ask everybody who's entering into our program to do the seabird identification quiz that has a standardized level of what we consider advanced, intermediate, and beginner bird identifying images. So this way we uh, could at least have one standardized format for what do we consider a expert birder versus a beginner birder. So everybody's taking the same quiz, they're uh, looking at the same images, um, and it's just a simple way for us to have that base level of how much of a birder you are. <laughs> Though of course it's, we know that Behavior is important when you're in the field. Lighting is important. All of these different factors would influence your ability to see something and identify it correctly in the fields. But at least to ha for us to have something at a base level to start off at, we could have some way to gauge whether their identification is hopefully correct versus incorrect. At the same time, we um, do allow people who aren't confident with their identification skills to join a team with somebody who's considered an expert who is a little bit more um, advanced with their identification ability so that they could feel like they could learn some more and also get better in their identification ability in general. So we don't have many qualifiers other than that to have people join. We ask everybody who's willing to take the time to and do their best to join, um, and then just try to give them as many tools as possible to get better. Any other questions? How many sites did you add in Whatcom County here this year? Uh, so this year we've added Eight, I believe, eight or nine. Um, and that's not including um, Cherry Point as, as sites. That's, so we have four up in the Semiamu spit. And um, yeah, some, we have one in Bellingham downtown at the Fairhaven Marine Park and um, Birch Bay. So a couple in there too. So if you. Yes, that's right. Yeah, we do have one in Larrabee. Uh, yeah, on the beach there. And how's the coordination in our county between your group and the Whatcom group? Yeah, so we we tried to work with Eleanor uh, as much as and John as much as we could. Do you have the same protocol? No, we don't. So our protocol are actually very different. Um, we we require much more stringent uh, uh, timing specifically, so our timing is very um, restricted to this day and this four hour window, please, if we, as best you can, because we're trying to get that snapshot across all of Southern Salish Sea. Um, and also, we, we have people doing measurements for distance and bearing, um, and we do ask everybody in the team to work together to spot birds, identify them, and also to take those measurements. So. 
we have um, an outlined protocol, and during our trainings, we express how best to do it, like what's the best method to work together to get all of those measurements and also, also all of those birds recorded at the same time. Um, and of course, we just say, just try to do your best. And, and maybe I missed it, but are you oh, yes. checking the same birds? Uh, checking the same birds? Um, I, yeah, I believe so. So we... Yes. We try to record all of the birds within that 300 meter um, on the water uh, area radius from you. So we're looking at gulls, ducks, cormorants, loons, um, no shorebirds, no shorebirds, no terrestrial birds. Um, and yeah, so our birds that we count are slightly different. Though we might be double counting Though we're not going to be doing any of the sites that the, the um, Cherry Point or Fidalgo Bay. I'm referring to the species. Oh, okay. Are you doing the same species? Yeah, we're doing a little bit more, but we don't record herons, though. That's the thing. Thanks. <laughs>